We will play a game of keeping the mouse and running a stable frame of the motion variety. It actually gives you the perception that it is so much smoother, so much uh, increased the visibility, or well, increased the uh, yeah, smoothness <laughs> in the actual gameplay when moving around uh, quickly. Uh, so it's a pretty nice game. But it's only an option, I can say, because it costs a lot of resources to do that, especially as the vectors are. Is an HDR, so uh, the HDR part is important because it keeps the bright light sources in front like long lines, and long streaks now, so the HDR is much more clear and uh, much more resistant. So here we have a little stream, that's a tune for the Boston Film Festival, color grading. This is, this is just for a, a frame, I was pretty happy, pretty lucky just grabbing this specific screenshot here. Uh, just for a frame when the explosion goes off. Uh, it's not enough that the explosion just lights up the environment. It also changes very, very briefly the, the, the color of the screen uh, by tinting uh, everything uh, through a 3D volume texture and look at. Uh, and we use this for other types of more nuanced uh, approaches. Uh, and here we have a pretty extreme combination of pixels. This is well running, so there's a little bit of motion blur, and then there's a blur on the screen because you can hit. Which is a little bit annoying, but it's also an important part of it. There's a magnetic effect, you can see that the screen, and that's a strawberry yeah. apple. Okay, so I've gone through quite a lot of different, of the different systems we have and different types of visual effects and how all of those interact. So here's a sort of a breakdown of our scenes and how, how we end up with this final picture. Um, so this is, this is the goal of the picture. So we start with something like this. Uh, not very impressive, but very important key detail. Have you already been there? It has a lot of detail on it, but it doesn't look that sexy here, but it has, um, this is without any lighting at So this is pretty much what we're running into the team of in the beginning. So we start with some frame. Uh, we add the uh, awesome meshes, which are meshes that can be destroyed or be affected. Uh, have, they're multiple parts in them. They're impossible to the meshes to watch. So they have all of the man-made buildings here, uh, pretty much. We also have uh, had our rigid meshes, a rigid mesh is just a, pretty much a static mesh that has no parts. It's just like the box here and some smaller details and smaller parts, I think that. Uh, then we have foliage, not that much foliage in this game, but it's just some of it. Uh, we also have decals, which is the thing, uh, just the physical decals here on the sides of the, the wall systems. Um, and then, when we rendered the, those passes before, we actually <coughs> rendered the G buffer, we were actually rendering these four, four different type of buffers. Uh, so what we're doing there, we actually got this view of uh, normals also, as well as the uh, specular term and, and the smoothness term for the environment. So we actually have rendered, uh, rendered out all of those things. Uh, and then in the next pass, oh yeah, we actually have a sky to both terms, which is, uh, it contains multiple things. The, the trees are blue here because I have a translucency effect on them, and the, the rest of them is are red, because the, the, in the red, is, uh, the intensity of the red is pretty much red. How this whole the sky is from for, for a specific pixel to be used for 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 lighting uh, to affect how this works. Yeah. Uh, and then once that is done, we render out that view over with all the objects. We start with our light up. So this is uh, rendering out the light for for the sky and for the bounce light that you saw before, and combining both of them on all the objects. So you see here, there's no sunlight at all in this video, uh, but you see some mountains from the sun. Actually, you see some brighter areas in the in the scene. You see, there's a general blue tint also because the sky is uh, generally quite blue here. Um, then, we have the, then we have the sunlight on top of everything. And now you have a, something that looks like a perfect white environment pretty much. Because it's in the sky and then also like um, And then the final lighting stage is to add also a couple of local light sources that so can switch between those. It's just a couple of light sources in this specific scene. Some other scenes are dominated by these light sources. Which are typically fog lights or spot lights or line lights in, in the environment here. And now once we have done all of this lighting, actually, then we combine the lighting with the with the uh, the buffer, the diffuse term, the specular terms, and the other terms of fire. So we get this this uh, combined picture. This, this actually looks like a standard game screenshot, pretty much, except it doesn't have the sky. So that's how it's going to be. So now we're actually moving to in the HDR. We combine all of these buffers, the lighting and the, the colors, and rendering the sky. So now we're rendering the HDR, combining all these. And just adding more stuff on top of it. So we added the sky, but we sort of see a pretty harsh border between the sky and the landscape. So we add some atmospheric scattering as well in the scene to make it sort of fit into the better. So now we have a scene that yeah, I think it actually fits in pretty well, but the actual uh, colors here look pretty off. Uh, 
so, oh yeah, we don't have sun. So we have sun and something to glare against, uh, which is sort of a part of the visual style of uh, uh, BSG. Uh, and then the blue that I talked about was super apparent from the screen, but we, we have it in the end here always. Uh, that also it has a little bit of tint, but it also smooths out some of the hard edges that we have in the environment, so, uh, at least in the screen. Uh, this is the final set, it's our color gradient, which is a specific artistic choice on this level. As it works, uh, that they wanted to have a, a cool feeling because you can't you can't find out this is the level where you base jump. You base jump down to this direction, you still have any numbers, so it's cool. And so they they, they have traced the picture a bit and emphasized the, the blue color as well. So that's sort of let me know so we build up the entire frame of the uh, frame of the as well. So that was something I have a like, final section of the talk just talking about a little bit mixed up with things about graphics and, and uh, graphics options and performance. So Here's a list of, well, if you play the beta, you probably saw similar stuff here, although in the beta, not all of the graphics options uh, work, so we can have a little bit broken, we, we fix it up now, we find a fun one. Beta is primarily intended for testing the back end and the models are in the core game to fix it up. So, uh, and overall, our graphics options are, we have four major paths <laughs> of uh, low quality, medium, high, and ultra. So, uh, sort of giving people an idea of uh, what, how we intended that these options to be used. Uh, lowest really, uh, well, of course, is the low, absolute lowest possible number of graphics, but as we have a multiplayer game, we can't scale it down and make it look too bad. Well, it can look, <laughs> it has to look respectable in general, because we can't make it a game that looks just absolutely shit on the lowest possibilities. <laughs> and people that have some kind of graphics card still want to be able to play it and have a good experience. But even more importantly, in a multiplayer game, you can't just disable all everything. You can't just, uh, because that increases the visibility of too much. If you disable all the particles and disable all the shadows, it becomes like the Quake Arena, Quake Wii Arena. And that might be fun in itself, but it's not really fair to play a multiplayer game with the vicious style that we have. So we have a pretty high minus spec in general for the game uh, of an 8800 GT card. Um, that, that's sort of designed for this low, low detail. You might not have the best absolute experience, of course, but the game will run, and, and it's, it's, it won't be too unfair. It won't be That's the ideal. Uh, then we have the medium setting. There we actually enable a lot of the lot of the uh, that we have. Um, but not all of them. We use the SSA or the shape or stuff. And this is sort of intended for mid-range uh, DX10 cards. Uh, uh, that are quite a bit better than the 8800, but not as good as the new one in DX11 cards. Uh, but you can kind of see if we get a good innovation of quality. But then we also have the, the high graphics mode. And that's really what game is designed for. Uh, it's designed for people to use that because you get a good frame rate from it. it oh, but it's always a personal preference. Do you want 60 FPS and you want uh, well, even higher FPS? Or do you want a little bit lower FPS but even higher quality? So it's, it's difficult to say exactly uh, what's the best choice for you. But for hardcore gamers, plus, it's usually 60 FPS or something. But the uh, medium runs well and high runs really well on the 560Ti or well, the 2480 was designed to really well on 64 FPS. And it has everything in the high mode, except uh, that some of them are not going to have to find the uh, detail settings. Yeah, yeah. That's what they have to alter for. So it's just going to get up further. And um, uh, where the shadows are sure a little bit sharper and the grid is a little bit more translated. Uh, also, we have the, the big setting of the Moltres that uh, our ideal setting. We use uh, our mobile sampling up there, which is really, really memory consuming and really uh, performance consuming in general. But it looks better. It doesn't look giant. It's not a giant step of the show quality, but it still looks good. So if you have a multi team view machine, like the ones we're seeing here, the dual 580, or a dual 560 for that matter, also, Ultra, you can run that at 60 FPS. And that's usually what we're going to but it kind of works perfectly. Uh, so I didn't mention the, the, the yellow thing, and that's something we've been spending quite a lot of time on. Uh, because the yellow thing is sort of, well, from a vicious point of view, it's, it's, it's annoying. It's something that flickers on the screen, you see pixels moving around, uh, and it's, it's not very pleasant to look at such things. But it's also annoying from the game point of view because it, 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 it distracts the eyes and your eyes. You sort of find these small qualities, and you get pretty used to it, but maybe you don't know the other thing. 
But with the Twitch platform on time with this, then it's especially difficult with differentiating because they don't use the traditional multi sampling the traditional MSA models where just the chord rendering and render with ATX MSA or something. We have to do have to spend a lot more special care to do differentiating because this G that I talked about, that has to be rendered out with a much higher resolution then. So we have multiple options here. We have the defer the uh, yeah, you saw them in the reference options. We have MPL team deferred, as we we'll call it, which is the MSA approach. You're using 2x and 4x to the MPL team. It's really having 4x is really running the game in double the width and double the height, pretty much. But with some clever optimizations on top of that. Uh, or we have the post processing post processing MPL team approaches also, which is we use uh, FXA. Uh, this is the NVIDIA tool to help us for NVIDIA drops. We have multiple problem settings also. That's, that's rendered at the ordinary resolution. But, and then it's a simple, well, not simple, exactly, but complex post processing effect that is being added afterwards to try and fix up the picture. Uh, but once we added all these options, we also found that it makes a lot of sense actually to have support both of these at the same time to be all looking at the quality. That's what we use for Ultra also, to combine both of these. Because MSA is really good at finding, uh, in, uh, fixing aliasing due to geometry detail being, being well, small type of geometry details or foliage or that type of, that type of, that type of thing. But it's not as good at fixing edges because it's, it's, also, it's not done in HDR that MSA, it's done in an earlier stage, so it's not as good at fixing uh, aliasing on very bright edges or things like that. So, but on the other hand, the post processing, uh, post processing DLC solution, that runs after the final pictures are rendered, so it runs in a different gamma space and it, it finds those edges as good as them out. But in, in, in itself, the MSA is not that good at fixing. Still, it seems due to the geometry and stuff like that. So, it's a combination of both makes it really good. But uh, this is, these are both completely optional features, but I think it works with the works badly. And we are just talking about MSA, and here's one of the conversations we have for MSA is that we're just brute forcing and running everything, every, the entire scene is super sample, and we're going to get lighting four times for every, every pixel. That's extremely expensive. And it's extremely wasteful also because you don't get that much of the detail, not much of it. So what we do is good is that we do selective super samples for our, for our lighting using MSA mode. And so we detect the edges that we have on screen and all these super samples look significantly improves the performance of But it's still a big, big, big thing. Yeah, just a couple of... We're talking about a bit of performance in the game. Typically when... When running games, when, well, when you guys run games, there's not really that many tools for tracking performance. There's well, you can run maps to develop a small FPS counter, or you can run, uh, yeah, no, there's a couple of tools that show the GPU and stuff like that, but they're not really that uh, good or that detailed. And especially CPU performance performance over time is a little bit difficult to track, so we've added a couple of things in, in there to make it a little bit easier for, for hardware games. Uh, first, of thing, first of all, we've added a, well, we have a tech and console, classic PC console, where we have a whole bunch of console commands uh, that can be uh, activated. <laughs> If I knew that was the feature that would get the most applause, we probably could have done it at first and skipped all of the lighting stuff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's good. Uh, we, have, we, don't have, we don't have a huge amount of console commands, but I think we can... Well, actually, the engine has a huge amount of console commands. We have around 3,000 commands, but we don't expose all of them. We expose just a select few... Well, uh, I'm not sure, 100 of them or something, because... You can't use the visualization modes that I was using here for the screenshots because some of the play will only show the normal maps or something. That would be a bit unfair, I hope you agree with um, And we also have a, like, a crap style FPS meter that's very simple to show up to activate this whole command. Thank you. And we also have this, which I haven't seen in any. This is part of our development tools. We have a way more, even more advanced tools also, but this is a very cool thing that we should play games at, uh, at all the time. It, it shows a graph, a yellow and a green graph, a graph. And the yellow graph is the CPU performance over each frame. Every pixel here, this is an animated line, so every pixel is a frame. And the green is a CPU performance graph. So it counts on no of uh, It could be spikes in performance, although it can be difficult to track down the same problems like this. But at least see if you have super stable performance or if you have some major problem or, or things like that. And I did talk about it more on forums or report it to us and things like that. So I think that would be quite helpful. And here's a zoom in on that. So we have a middle line sort of, we have 30 FPS of the line, uh, 
a little bit turned down with the 60 FPS. And here, you see here, I got a couple of big spikes. I did the two earlier ones when I, was when I took a screenshot myself. Because then, well, it takes a present time to actually take a screenshot. Uh, <coughs> yeah, so that's pretty good. And uh, then the final thing that I must mention is uh, our stereo rendering. Some of you guys probably already played with the big screen stereo here in the tournament. And that's actually something we've been working with closely with the video with. Just now, just now in the end of the project, once everything is, is sort of coming together, we're well, doing really proper stereo rendering support. Because when you use the per shading, uh, again, and not doing more traditional rendering process, you have to do it in a more custom way. You have to render two completely different pictures for, for the high and not have it done automatically with the darkness, which the three division otherwise supports, because it doesn't work with the per shading. You instead have to do it, have it implemented ourselves in the engine. And we've done that in this part too, that's in V3, which is cool. And we actually render these two frames completely in parallel also, so if you have a, have a better plus, well, one for even more CPUs, it, it scales up very nicely there. Um, which is great, but then works with all the post processes you made and everything we talked about here. But as we're rendering everything twice, it's really heavy, so we need a really good CPU. Really good copy, ideally too, because it's also fun. Oh, uh, there you go. So, that was uh, yeah, a little bit last one today. I see somewhere here in the last one, that's what I'm saying. I think, personally, I think our game looks pretty sweet. I hope you guys agree. Yeah! Woo! I'm really trying to try to try and combine the, the, the massive uh, Battlefield gameplay experience with the visual style uh, and, and the great visuals that we have and make it for PC. And this is just a start. All of this that we put in, we put into our engine, uh, and there's many games of the EA and DICE going forward with the same engine. And I also think that we'll see quite a few other games that are sort of a little bit more than we need and at least really confident PC versions going forward. So, future strike. Very cool. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. You guys appreciate that tonight? Okay, good question. Well, the question is, how many man hours went into the delivery of Battlefield 3? Oh, well, we got the entire device program. The device is 250 uh, from, I'm not sure exactly the first one. Uh, so I'm not sure if you can say how many man hours, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. So the answer is wrong. Yeah. It's huge amounts. You know what, that's worth a ticket. There you go. All right, here we go. We're right here. What's your question? Next question. Okay, right here. Hello, Hello. 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 Uh, and we're going to think about something we don't have to do with us there. Not right now, but next time we're going to have a ticket. Alright, one more ticket to give away. It's going to be right here. Right here! Right here! Next time we're going to have a ticket. So, Johan, we see a lot of weather in the single player. Is there a plan to implement that in multiplayer? No, 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 no,